The following interview was conducted with Professor Henry N. Shealy, Associate Professor of Communication for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on, on uh, Tuesday, May 3rd, 2011, in his office in Bering uh, Hall. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis. This is part three, because part two got a little bit aborted. And he's talking a little bit about his publication, The Charlie Holland Political Biography. <laughs> Okay, do you have any particular question that uh, you'd like to ask? I was just going to ask, um, how did you select a publisher? Well, that was um, an interesting story. Uh, Harper and Rowe was going to uh, do the book. I, they wanted me to send the entire uh, book to them. They, they didn't even want to see a, a chapter or a sample, and I thought that that's the way it should be done. Uh -huh. And um, one of the um, fellows from Harper and Row worked with me for almost a year on it, and uh, uh, it's uh, a very interesting story that I'm going to make very brief, and that is that um, uh, the book was uh, blackballed by one of the members of the trustees of the uh, company, Harper and Row. They didn't want uh, to uh, publish a book on Charlie Halleck, a Republican, and the fellow was uh, a family member of the Kennedy family. And I was very surprised at that because uh, Halleck uh, liked Jack Kennedy very well, worked with him on uh, civil rights, and uh, uh, it, it was a very unusual thing that uh, happened, and they dropped the project. So I had to go look for another publisher, and it took uh, a, a while to get one. We, we got a publishing outfit out of, out of New York to do it, Banner Press, and we wanted to uh, beat the um, election in 1966. Uh, the book was published in '66, and uh, Halleck was going to run. Uh, it was his second last term uh, after he got beat by Jerry Ford, which I'll discuss uh, later. Uh, we uh, uh, rushed the uh, publication so that we could get it out before the uh, second last campaign of his uh, career. And uh, we went with uh, Banner Books in New York, and that was um, uh, how that was done. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it was kind of a, uh, a shock uh, because we had worked uh, with um, Harper's, and it was essentially vetoed at the last oh, minute. Sure. Did yeah. you have any book signings at all? Oh, yes. Yeah, we. Uh, I, I travel all over the uh, not necessarily the country. I'd say it was basically the uh, Washington, D.C. area. Uh -huh. I had maybe about 28 different interviews, uh, ra radio uh, interviews, more than uh, television. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, uh, then all through uh, Indiana, the book uh, was selected as the um, book of the year. Let's see, what year was it? 1966. Mm hmm and um, uh, it was called the most distinguished book of the year in the biography category uh, by the Indiana University Committee for Indiana Authors. And, and on Authors Day, they gave me a, an award or a recognition for publishing the best book of uh, the, the year. And to get any recognition out of Indiana University was an achievement. Uh, at that time, and sure. uh, so we we were quite thrilled with that. I would think but, so. That's right. A sure. uh, couple comments on presidential debates. I believe you sometimes people ask. And the first one, of course, was the Nixon Kennedy in 1960. Yes, um, we um, uh, studied the uh, political debates in, in my classes. I, I taught two key classes. Uh, one was called Campaign Communication, where we studied the presidents from Harry Truman uh, through the present. And that uh, 
uh, brought us up to what we call Obama. I uh, stopped teaching graduate students about uh, three or four years ago, so I did not teach the Obama campaign, but we talked about all the other campaigns, uh, the Give Him Hell Harry campaign, and then each of the presidential campaigns thereafter, and looked at campaign strategies, advertisements, uh, uh, political speeches that were given in the campaigns, the study of the conventions, uh, and uh, the importance of those uh, nomination speeches and the mm-hmm. acceptance addresses and so forth. So that was um, one of my major courses. And then the other course uh, dealt with the presidential speaking of the candidates after they are elected. And you'll probably notice from the Obama campaign, which I did not um, teach in class, but basically Obama was a terrific campaigner, no question about it, and his speaking was... uh, uh, brilliant that um, the there is a difference between campaign speaking and then speaking while you are president and running the country at a given time and uh, uh, so the speeches like the State of the Union address they are uh, uh, given during the presidency and those speeches once you're elected are a little different than the speeches that are given on the campaign. Mm -hmm. And really, if you trace through a lot of campaign speaking, speaking, you'll notice that the policies that were advanced and supported in the campaign are never incorporated once they become uh, president. So uh, the debates uh, that we studied, uh, the first one, was the Kennedy-Nixon debate, and that was the most famous debate since uh, um, the uh, Douglas-Lincoln debates of uh, maybe a hundred plus years before. Mm -hmm. And uh, this debate was uh, uh, really uh, something special. Television had just grown from its infancy to a prominent uh, uh, position, and uh, something like... uh, 80,000, 80, 80 million, 80 million people would be watching this debate, and it attracted the biggest uh, crowd, I believe, in the uh, uh, history of the TV industry. And that particular debate was actually uh, encouraged and promoted by the television industry, which was struggling a little bit with their uh, I Love Lucy shows and uh, their wrestling uh, contests and whatnot and television was not refined in the 50s and 60s very much and they were looking for a good show and uh, the producers, uh, the leading producers in the TV industry recommended and asked the two candidates uh, if they would participate in these uh, debates and um, there was a a problem in terms of the rules of the uh, communication uh, industry that uh, uh, if you let uh, one candidate from one political party speak, you got to let the other one speak. And they made some kind of adjustments that just uh, Kennedy and Nixon could speak, would be legal, would go ahead and do it, and uh, Eisenhower, who actually approved of the um, the concept of, of uh, uh, presidential debates, recommended that Nixon do, does not participate. He didn't want Nixon to do it because Nixon, at that point in time, uh, was the vice president, had built up an eight-year record as vice president had participated in the in the popular Eisenhower administration. Eisenhower won two enormous uh, landslide victories over Adlai Stevenson, the governor of uh, Illinois. And uh, um, he thought that it would be unwise to share the audience uh, with the uh, lesser-known John F. Kennedy from uh, Massachusetts. So... Uh, 
Uh, Nixon was uh, a very successful speaker in terms of his checker speech back in about 1952 when he was selected as uh, vice president. He was accused of accepting something like a $16,000 sum of money to help him with his expenses. And although we think of $16,000 now as a drop in the bucket for a political campaign when Obama's t- uh, now talking about getting $2 billion with Internet uh, uh, solicitations, etc. Uh, he um, had to defend his perceived uh, illegal and dishonest activities in what was called the checker speech. And he handled that so well that it saved his job. And he stayed on a ticket. Uh, Eisenhower didn't have to drop him. He was uh, certainly thinking of uh, switching and not taking this young, uh, uh, what relatively bright um, uh, senator from uh, California. But um, uh, that uh, uh, situation gave him, that is Nixon, the confidence that he could do well on television. And in in the case of this uh, uh, debate um, and the campaign, it, it was the major event of the 1960 campaign. And um, I, I can't help but look at the article right here in front of me because we put on the blackboard for this lecture that I gave. It's called my final lecture. Uh, we got the totals of that campaign in terms of how close it was. Here it is. JFK got 34 million votes. So did Nixon. Uh, JFK got 49.7% of the uh, votes in that campaign. Nixon got 496 It was a difference of 112,000 votes uh, that separated uh, that uh, campaign and uh, this uh, debate was a very significant event in the in the uh, the closest election I think in the in history at that uh, particular time and uh, uh, Nixon did hurt his knee. Now I attended the 1960 convention while I was doing research on Halleck for my uh, doctoral dissertation, and uh, I. Uh, did some uh, research in the uh, in the galleries and asked uh, people how what they thought of primarily Halleck, but uh, uh, Nixon, of course, was was the key man. Halleck was the uh, chairman of that convention because he was the uh, was a significant leader in the party. He was the minority leader and was asked to preside over the convention, mm-hmm. and uh, essentially that. Uh, uh, debate occurred, and, and Nixon hurt his uh, knee, bumped his knee, and got a, an infection, oh, about a month before the debates, and uh, spent almost two full weeks in the hospital, and uh, lost some time in the campaign. He was ahead for a while in the uh, in the electoral vote, and uh, uh, then on the way to the debates, getting out of the car, Nixon hit his knee again for a second time, and he gave his uh, debate, debate one, in what I'd call a pained uh, condition. He didn't look good. His mother called after the debate and asked whether or not he was sick and uh, what had happened to him, and uh, he didn't know he was that bad, but uh, he didn't... uh, cooperate with the makeup man and so forth, wore the wrong colored suit, uh, did everything uh, uh, in comparison to Kennedy that uh, was uh, uh, secondary and did not appear well on uh, debate. Now, I was at a conference at uh, Lyndon Johnson's uh, library, and uh, George Reedy was the... uh, was on a panel with me, and Reedy uh, was uh, Lyndon Johnson's press secretary, and uh, 
and I, I was talking about Halleck, and uh, he was talking about Johnson on the panel. He said what we did in that debate situation is we put, uh, Lyndon and I put all the uh, uh, fellows in the two different rooms. We split up our party. We had about 20 people. This is George Reedy speaking. He's the press secretary. And he said we put um, about 10 of them in uh, one room to watch the debates on television and 10 in the, other, uh, in the other room to watch it on, or listen to it on radio. And uh, one group came back and said, boy, we won this one. We really took care of that uh, Nixon. And this was the television crowd. Because Kennedy was tanned. He had spent the uh, afternoon up on the roof of the uh, studio where he was staying and just lying in a, in a chair. This is according to Ted Sorensen, who I saw at a, at a Kennedy conference later. And he uh, um, was tanned, looked young, youthful, and attractive, even though they said that before that debate only 50% of the people knew who John F. Kennedy was. When he was debating against uh, Nixon, he looked so much better, and he held his own and all he had to do was indicate that he was as competent and as uh, good as uh, Nixon in terms of intellect, handling the issues, and speaking. And uh, he won that debate on TV. Now, the, uh, even the Democratic uh, fellows of uh, George Reedy's group who were at the uh, uh, Johnson uh, Ranch watching this debate they said that uh, on radio, Nixon won the contest. And for them to admit that their man lost, they were quite worried about it. Fortunately for the uh, Democrats, uh, more people watched this debate on uh, television than they did listening to it. And although uh, some people credit Nixon for winning the last three debates, the impression that Kennedy gave during the first one was so dominant uh, and so uh, uh, appealing that um, it was a, regarded as really a major mass media event that influenced the election. And many say Kennedy won that election because of that first TV mm -hmm. debate. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, family, I think you talked a little bit about that. And you might mention your, your wife was in the department. You were both retiring. Yeah, we uh, are both retiring this week, uh -huh. and uh, uh, actually she officially taught her last class in December. She wanted to teach until her granddaughter uh, uh, graduated, and uh, it was just, uh, uh, she graduated a semester earlier than expected. We were going to, uh, she was going to step down in uh, um, spring, May. Uh, two weeks from now, but uh, she decided that uh, uh, the granddaughter here was uh, Elizabeth, and uh, she was going to uh, graduate, and uh, she did. She works in the um, uh, accounting business, Ernst & Young, in Chicago now, and uh, uh, she uh, is through, and... Uh, finished, and uh, our grandson had graduated from Purdue in engineering the, uh, well, or the year before, and uh, she felt that 25 years was enough, and uh, after uh, helping the department out, she taught only on a half-time basis, but uh, she filled the, uh, the needs of the department with kind of a roving uh, instructor and helped uh, when we were short of teachers and we often were in 114 and sometimes in 315 this speech for technology students so she uh, decided that uh, her services uh, were enough 25 years was enough good so her anniversary right and, yeah uh, any awards and honors that you receive that you'd like to comment on Special? Well, uh, I uh, 
had, had a look some of them up, some of them up before because, uh, you know, I've been here um, parts of uh, seven <laughs> decades, and I have won, won a few. Mm -hmm. um, uh, according to my abbreviated uh, Vita year, uh, I was the number one contributor of um, articles from the field of communication of refereed academic uh, articles published in uh, Presidential Studies quarterly, quarterly from 1987 to 2002. Almost, uh, that actually went, went maybe even beyond that. There was um, um, one um, honor as a member of the uh, round table of the first uh, um, inaugural program in presidential rhetoric that was sponsored by the Center for the Presidential Studies at Texas A&M University. And I was on a panel entitled The, the Ten, a uh, round table, the ten of the leading scholars of presidential communication throughout the nation. I consider that an honor. Mm -hmm. I was the nominee uh, for the Outstanding Undergraduate Teaching Award, the Charlie Murphy Award. Uh, Charlie Murphy and I actually taught uh, together in the Great Issues uh, class. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a class that was required for seniors at uh, Purdue and dealt with the Great Issues of War and Peace and Education and whatnot. There are all kinds of the Great Issues. I did win the MCL Teaching Award in the School of Humanities, um, Social Science and Education. That's before we became the Liberal Arts School. And I won uh, that Teaching Award. I, um, I won that Most Distinguished Book Award in um, 1966. And there were a couple other teaching awards. I, Charles uh, Redding um, Award for Outstanding Undergraduate Teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this is my abbreviate. Mm -hmm. I got a 31-page oh, Vita God. over here with several other honors. I had given the, a top paper at several conventions. And I've done a lot of things that every other professor does, too. So, I mean, I don't... Think that I but was you, the any, key but ones are really nice. That's good. Yeah. Um, now you got a, about to change the name of your school as you're retiring. You now got a school. Right, and I I'm thrilled about that. Uh, Brian Lamb uh, was one of our undergraduate students in speech here at at Purdue. He set up the uh, C-SPAN operation with about uh, three uh, different channels of uh, cable television. He records all the uh, speeches in the U.S. Senate and the speeches in the U.S. House of Representatives. And these are all kept at Purdue. And, uh, of course, he's conducted interviews with thousands of uh, people that have been prominent uh, from the 70s to the present. And he's uh, done more for... Um, Oh, what we call the communication arts and uh, uh, just about anybody we know and we consider it an honor that he has agreed to attach his name to our uh, department and uh, as an alum uh, it's a great uh, contribution so we're, we're very happy to now be called uh, the uh, Brian Lamb School of Communication instead of just the Department of Communication at Purdue University. We are now a school, right. and uh, that, that's great. Very nice. How about a Purdue tradition? Anyone uh, that comes to mind? Well, Probably you mentioned maybe earlier the baseball's been kind of good, and the sports. Well, I, I have been... Uh, I have done more recruiting probably for uh, the athletic department and ball players and basketball players, football players. And of course, I probably have attended 
more baseball games than any faculty <laughs> member in the history of the university. <laughs> I dare anyone to name somebody that's seen more Purdue baseball games than any Sheely. But uh, uh, those uh, were wonderful experiences, and uh, I uh, have had several All-Americans in my classrooms, I was starting with uh, Rick Mount, who is uh, a Purdue Big Ten icon. He's selected one of the top ten players in the history of uh, basketball in the conference. He was one of my students. My father, may his soul rest in peace, he uh, saw one game at Purdue. He was my guest. I said, now watch this Rick Mount. He's my student. And Rick Mount set the Big Ten record, which still stands. And this was something like, uh, oh, about, uh, let's say this might, might have been set around uh, 68, 69, something like that. And it's now 2011. But Rick Mount scored uh, 61 points that night. A record that's in one game. In one game. 61 points in one game. I heard an interview on the radio with Rick uh, one time, uh, and uh, Rick said that if the three-point rule was in effect, I would have had, I think it was 75 uh, points, give or take one or more, and uh, he admitted he made, he was the greatest shooter, I think, that Indiana has ever produced, and my dad saw that one game, and I, I'll, I'll never forget it. I got to see the first game in Mac Arena that uh, Rick played in. I will uh, recall that he did something wrong. He had about six or seven seconds left in a tie game against UCLA, and he took a shot. And I said, Rick, that's t too, too quick. To, uh, run, run a few more seconds on the two. Well, they got the rebound, went down in the last second. They la laid it in, and we lost the game by two points. So even if he missed, we would have had a, had overtime. Yeah. We would have had another time. To win it. Uh, uh. So I I saw that, but uh, and I've had um, oh three golden girls in class and the gal in black. I had and the gal in black once gave a speech where she um, twirled her baton and she had a a, a knife. I don't know what what this was made of, but. Uh, a big, it was a sword, and in the classroom, she twirled this sword across, and I, I ducked, and I told everybody to lie low, because I didn't want her to cut the head off of any of my students, and it looks awful scary, but she uh, performed this little uh, demonstration on twirling, and uh, it was uh, quite, quite an incident, uh, too. But I do uh, appreciate all the All-Americans I had, especially uh, Katie Douglas, and Joy Holmes, and then uh, uh, Glenn Robinson, the big dog. And uh, I had many great basketball players. Everett Stevens, I'm proud that Everett's now sending his son to Purdue. He'll be in one of the future recruiting classes. And... Uh, uh, I had a, an opportunity to have a number of these uh, athletes, male and female, uh, attend my uh, course in public speaking. I got to put in one plug for my course, Comp 314, mm -hmm. because uh, Simon & Schuster published a book uh, relating to the top 200 colleges in America and what were the recommended courses the top four courses at each of these different colleges. And the recommended course, according to the students and whatnot and all who participated in this poll at Purdue was, uh, one of the four was COM 314, which is my advanced public speaking class, which a lot of the athletes uh, uh, took. They knew that uh, uh, Hank would uh, excuse him for the athletic events because he was a college athlete himself and knew that these trips were necessary. <laughs> a number of my colleagues uh, uh, who I lived on 
with them on Chauncey Street, and I won't mention names, but they did not appreciate the fact that these athletes would miss class to go to play a basketball game or a football game. Actually, the football wasn't that much of a problem. They, they didn't miss as many classes. But the basketball and baseball players had to miss classes because a lot of those games were played um, at one of the days during the week. And I would always uh, give them um, an opportunity to uh, make it up. Uh, I, I do have a story to tell about Joe Sexton. Joe Sexton just died uh, the, yesterday or the day before. And he was a great coach, one of the greatest athletes that Purdue ever acquired, Mr. Basketball in Indiana. Great baseball player, baseball coach at Purdue. And uh, we, um, uh, I had to let Rick Mount out of class for about two weeks for some kind of McDonald's All-American type of tournament that was going on when Rick was about a, a junior, I guess, or a sophomore in college. It wasn't the high school McDonald All-American thing, but it was some function. And I said, well, I'll let Rick go for two weeks if he makes up the work. Well, Rick didn't make up the work, so I had to give him an incomplete. And I said, what we'll do is, Rick, you come in the summer, you take this work and you do it in the summer, and he never would show up to class. So I called up the athletic department, and Joe Sexton said, I'll get him over there. And uh, uh, he brought him over there, and he made the makeup speeches, and uh, we, we got it done, and we, we passed them, and we kept them eligible, but it took a little, little effort. I guess that uh, Joe said that uh, Rick was a little embarrassed because he looked in the window at the class that I had, and it was something like 11 girls for every boy, and there were only about two boys in the class, and he was a little bashful. And he didn't want to have to give his speeches before all these girls. But uh, we uh, yeah, got him to do it, and, sure. and he did well. Yeah. How about an outstanding event? Anything special comes to mind? Uh, we have more than one. Well, uh, the, uh, the events were, of course, uh, Jess and I went to the Rose Bowl game. And we did like uh, the Rose Bowl. That was sure a special event. And uh, uh, we've been to many of the uh, uh, functions of the, of the university. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say probably the, the Rose Bowl was the uh, biggest uh, event that we went and saw and Drew Brees play and of course uh, Drew Brees became the cover boy like um, Rick Mount was. Rick Mount was the cover boy as a high school basketball player on the Sports Illustrated, and it took um, um, Drew Brees to win uh, the Super Bowl before he got on the cover. But they both made it, and some of our Purdue guys have really uh, done a lot for the national publicity of the uh, uh, university, and I think some of our sports members are underrated in terms of their contribution to the publicity yeah. right. of the uh, right. of the school. In closing, is there anything I forgot to ask, or anything you'd like to add? Well, well I, post well, to list the post retirement, post Purdue. Okay, I I uh, am retiring a year earlier than I expected. And I've been so wrapped up in um, the procedures for getting out that I haven't thought beyond uh, the uh, the day, whatever. the day, which is uh, yeah. uh, about ten days from now when, when I retire. Yeah. And uh, when I go home tonight, uh, I will have to read the uh, Purdue uh, health plan and uh, the uh, retirement uh, procedures and so forth. And I'll, I'll but work you're planning, on. You're planning to stay in the community, though. But I intend to okay. stay here. Uh, the uh, Purdue community has been good to me. Uh, Mrs. Sheely has uh, been.
been active in the community. She is the first chairman of the Feast of the Hunter's Moon, started this event uh, as a co-chairman, and uh, this event brings in a million dollars a year now to the community. She was president of the school board in, the, in West Lafayette, one of the finest uh, high schools in the state of Indiana. And we were happy to be part of that and live right next to the high school, a block or two away. And uh, we like the area. And uh, we think that Indiana's uh, underrated. Uh, people can call it a flyover state if they want to. But we'll stay here and uh, watch all the events that are uh, on campus and watch the convocations and enjoy life in the Big Ten. Sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Sheely. I appreciate that very much. <clears throat>